Uh, hello and welcome to Chatham House to our um, online webinar. Um, Leslie Benjamori, it's um, it's a delight, it's an honor, it's always a pleasure to um, chair conversations amongst my um, brilliant colleagues. And um, never so much as at a moment like this when the world is facing uh, extraordinary challenges, um, the privilege of talking to people who have a lot to contribute um, to our understanding is really uh, serious. We're on the record today. Um, we are recording, and I say that because when it comes time um, to asking your questions, you'll just want to be aware that we are recording and, and are likely to share the video. Um, we're here really uh, to talk about the G7, which has just finished in Germany. As you know, we are also in the midst, of course, of the NATO summit, um, uh, and, and that's a very significant moment for the world. Also, um, we were having a bit of a chat um, before, uh, before today's webinar about how significant the G7 is. Um, and of course, we know that, that the most, in many ways, the most important and longstanding uh, challenges um, we're certainly on the agenda. There is a there's a broader question as to you know to what extent those were actually um, dealt with. Let me quickly introduce my panelists and say a few words um, before I turn it over to Marianne and then and then Tim and then Rob. Um, Marianne Schneider Petzinger is senior research fellow on the U.S. and Americas program here at Chatham House. She has deep experience and expertise in trade and technology <clears throat> and the global economy. And I'm sure you're familiar uh, with her work. And if you're not, please do read her, her many publications. Um, Professor Tim Benton. Uh, Tim, in other words, is uh, director of the Environment Society Program, um, one of the world's leading experts on questions of food and food security, or rather perhaps insecurity, um, as well as uh, the uh, climate and environment issues um, more generally. He's also just a terrific leader here at Chatham House. And Rob Yates, who directs our global health program, um, has survived and continues to survive uh, the consequences of the pandemic, not only um, for all of us at Chatham House, but globally, and so has been a tremendous contributor over many years, um, even prior to his time at Chatham House. And I'm Leslie, and I know most of you, so thank you for joining. I guess the, the thing that I would say before I turn it over to Marianne to really sort of outline what was on the agenda and where we've come is uh, in some ways the obvious, the, the, the really big global challenges, whether it's to do with climate, um, health, uh, food in particular, and the, the food insecurity questions that are emanating and have been intensified by the war in Ukraine, um, or other longstanding issues in the global economy. Uh, they're on the agenda of the G7, but of course the world has so been so galvanized and, and the, especially the G7 have been so fixated on the short term and, and very deep and significant crisis uh, that's been with us for just over four months now since uh, Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine have really sort of shifted the attention and, and in some ways made those really important longer term questions harder to resolve. They were always gonna be difficult, but they're harder perhaps now than, than they were before, even with COVID, which I think in the, in the, in the beginning provided us a moment of thinking that this was a crisis that would really galvanize the world, bring it together and drive forward positive momentum on the climate front. And it doesn't feel like that's where we are today at all. The second thing I would add um, from the perspective of the US, since I um, lead our US uh, and America's work here at Chatham House is, as we all know, it's hard to imagine a more uh, a, a less opportune moment for the United States president to be you know, leaving the country and trying to lead abroad. It's, it's both tremendously important, but also if you look back at the United States, whether it's inflation, uh, whether it's the president's approval ratings, whether it's the ongoing polarization and division across the United States or the devastating um, decisions that have come out of the Supreme Court, which will drive um, politics and mobilization across the United States um, in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm referring, of course, to the reversal of Roe versus Wade. Um, and, and before that, the shocking and, and very tragic um, uh, gun violence and murders um, that we saw, that we've seen across the country, but especially in Texas. So um, not an easy time to pretend to be leading uh, from, from the vantage point of values if the question is about signaling those uh, at home. Um, so Marianne, let me turn it over to you 
to, to sort of set the stage for, you know, what the aspiration was for the G7 and perhaps where it, you know, what's come out of it. Well, thanks, Leslie. I do think that it's quite clear what the biggest success was. And that was a clear signal of unity and determination in supporting Ukraine. And I think this line in the final communique of we will stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes is quite powerful. That was obviously also backed up by budgetary support that the G7 leaders have pledged totaling 29 billion and humanitarian aid of 2.8 billion. So quite significant and also signaling a long-term commitment to proposing a global reconstruction plan, not the Marshall Plan, but something along those lines. And I think that is really the key achievement of this G7 summit to signal this ongoing support for Ukraine and addressing a range of other issues that are very much related to that. So the second key focus area was very much around addressing energy security. And here the leaders committed to take action to secure energy security, but also reduce the price surges that we've seen and um, perhaps down the road, one of the most impactful steps could be to do um, work around price caps. There isn't much that has actually been achieved on this front, but to kind of signal that G7 leaders want to work on that. Um, key question is, can they do it by themselves? Obviously they need to have to buy in from the private sector and also very much non G7 countries. So work in progress on that front. Investing in climate has been the third big pillar, but very much, I would say, sidelined and um, kind of marginalized by those broader discussions around energy security. And the leaders did come up in endorsing Germany's proposal for a climate club, but there isn't any details to be shared yet. It's very much you know, a commitment to work towards establishing this club by the end of 2022. But more broadly speaking, there was actually a lot of backsliding on climate. So contradictions on the one hand, energy security, and other, on the other hand, the kind of um, yeah, actual no commitment on phasing out fossil fuels, for example, and actually doubling down to some extent on um, investment in gas, which undermines the long-term commitment to decarbonize. The fourth big topic, and again, very much related to Russia and Ukraine's fallout, um, is food insecurity around the world. Here, the leaders launched a global alliance on food security and provided 4.5 billion to this end. Um, not quite sure you know, to what extent it actually makes a dent in the bucket because it does not meet the targets um, set out by the UN, falls far short of that. And I would also say there's um, other issues that were not tackled. For example, that critical issue of um, actually getting grain through the Black Sea, um, there is no commitment to actually you know, move, move the needle on that front. And last but not least, um, one kind of outcome of the summit was promoting the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. The leaders pledged to mobilize 600 billion over the next five years to narrow the global investment gap. That is very much more a rebranding and the recycling of an initiative that was launched a year ago at the G7 summit in Cornwall, the Build Fat Better World Initiative. So it's, um, yeah, fa failed to mostly deliver. And the question is, will this time be different? So overall, I think there were a number of small steps taken to solve multiple and compounding crises, but really the key work has just been pushed down the road. And there's also big, big pieces that we're missing. I think really what stands out in terms of big gaps is there is no effort to really strengthen institutional landscape for global health. Um, on food security, as I mentioned, um, not real progress faced with the worst hunger crisis in a generation. I think the G7 really failed to take any significant action that was needed. On fuel, there was any meaningful or the lack of a meaningful new climate finance commitment, lots of um, kind of backsliding, as I mentioned. And why there was this focus on the two Fs, fuel and food, a third F, finance and global debt crisis was totally ignored. I think there's really um, the decision now that is with the G20 to relieve the high indebted countries. And I think that is, again, where the, the G7 did not step up and is leaving the hard work to the G20.
I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Let me just um, add in a couple of um, uh, sort of footnotes to that. Those really uh, ter terrific comments before I come to Tim. One is on the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, which is you know a rebrand of the Build Back Better World initiative that was announced a year ago in Cornwall. Um, of that, I think it's 600 billion. To the, the U.S. Is, has promised uh, to deliver 200. Uh, and the EU 300, but the, the, the important thing to note about this is it's a model that's intended uh, to um, mobilize private capital. So the 200 billion isn't coming from the US government, it's coming from US government initiatives that put some money out in front, but really are, are aimed to, to, to hit that 200 by bringing in private capital. And that really is, you know, that's the rub. How does that work? What does that model look like? Um, is the private are private uh, investors confident um, that, that, that there's a reason to to invest as a global uh, climate, the economic climate conducive to mobilizing that capital? So it's you know it's already um, it's a rebrand. It's got a very specific kind of idea behind it, which I think is the right one. We know that governments can of capital can deliver the amount of capital that's needed, but can they actually encourage? Uh, private investors to, to fill that gap. That's the big question. It's something we're working on here, all of us on, on this Zoom um, at Chatham House and a big global recovery project. And we and the first report was out by Cynthia and Theo, who I see on the call. Uh, and, and I would refer you to it. Um, the second thing I wanted to note, the numbers that you put out at the start were really important. And, you know, as you say, you know, sort of continued commitment to Ukraine. But the numbers that we're hearing across the expert community globally is that Ukraine right now needs between five and seven billion dollars a month just to keep it going. So I think, you know, the, the magnitude of the need relative to the scale of the commitment, even if it's delivered on, that gap is, is already starting as a very, very large one. Um, but with that said, Tim, let me uh, turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Leslie. Thank you, Marianne. Um, I don't really have a lot to add. Marianne's done a fantastic sum summary. For me, perhaps the most important uh, learning I took away from the G7 summit was that to be a real leader, you had to stop wearing ties. And that sartorial elegance of the boys club uh, really, really struck me. And so I'm officially very old fashioned because I've got a tie on today. Um, the G7 communique, fantastic. It's, it's kind of like an undergraduate essay in a way. It's got all the important keywords in, millions of them, motherhood and apple pie. But actually, as Marianne said, absolutely misses the point in, in, in most, most of the kind of space that it's trying to judge. It's got, you know, lovely good wishes, but words are words. And as we're increasingly finding, particularly in climate change, uh, you know, you can have governments that are pledging this and pledging that and pledging the other, but unless they deliver, which they tend not to, uh, it all becomes meaningless. Um, and, you know, I'll just pick, up, pick out, because it's the kind of specialist area, uh, at the moment, the food security issues, as Marianne rightly said, we are in a state of utter global crisis. And we had a fantastic panel on this at the London conference last week, which was really quite scary. And to quote David Beasley, conditions are now much worse than during the Arab Spring in 2011 and in 2007-8, when there were food price, food price spikes. At these times, 48 countries were rocked by political unrest, riots and protests. We've already seen what's happening in Indonesia, Pakistan, Peru, and Sri Lanka, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. We have solutions, but we need to act and act fast. So that's the director of the FAO's World Food Programme. The, the communique says, we will spare no effort to increase global food and nutrition security and to protect the most vulnerable of whom the food crisis threatens to hit hardest. And then what do they do? Uh, GAFs. The Global Alliance on Food Security, as Marianne said, 4.5 billion broadly pledged at the time where the World Food Programme is asking for 22 billion to fulfill its humanitarian needs. So the G20 uh, controls 30% of the global economy, something like that. That's in the G uh, sorry, the G7, 30% uh, uh, of the global economy, pledging 20% of what the World Food Programme needs to avert famine, despite saying we will spare no effort. So I think 
you know, my take on this is that there's a lot more that could be done. Uh, you know, clearly there's a lot of behind the scenes and negotiating and working groups and all sorts of other things, uh, uh, tackling the food crisis and trying to uh, uh, unblockade Odessa at the same time where Russia is stealing grains and shipping them illegally uh, in boats with the transponders off gaining political leverage, making money as much, uh, not as much as uh, from selling fossil fuel to Europe. But there is an awful lot going on, which is uh, negative. And this is a real time and a real need for global leadership. And what we have is warm, warm words and very little action. And I think I'll leave it there, Leslie. Great, Tim, thank you. Yes, 31, uh, the G7 are around 31% of GDP. I, I mean, the interesting thing to know, and I will draw the, the NATO reference, maybe we'll come to it more in the discussion, but if you look at the sheer relative power of, mil, of, of NATO at measured by the total amount of military spend compared to the rest, and you compare that to the, the sheer economic weight of the G7, there's no doubt that NATO, NATO is, uh, you know, in relative terms, more important in its domain than the G7 is in it. So perhaps, you know, again, it's sort of a reminder to ourselves that the real meetings of the week, the real consequence, the real significance is perhaps, um, and maybe this is just my perspective, but um, what's coming out of the NATO summit. Having said that, the G7, you know, looks to be very am ambitious and there's a legacy here. And there's also a question of values, right? The G7 aren't just getting together because of the, the size of their economies. They're getting together because they share, you know, in principle, although it doesn't always look like that when you look back, at, in my case, at the United States, um, like they share a, a principle commitment to a certain way of living, a certain set of values and a certain way of driving forward uh, economic recovery. Um, but Rob, over to you. Thanks very much, Leslie. Um, well, I'd love to be able to book the trend and say things have been fantastic vis-a-vis uh, -vis health and the G7, but that wouldn't be uh, strictly honest. And, and I think, you know, really, when you look at what's been discussed at the G7 this year um, with respect to health, I think it really is a good opportunity to sort of look back at the, you know, the G7's performance through, through the pandemic, which has been a big existential threat where you really would have hoped that the G7 would have stepped up and, and, and acted uh, very effectively. Uh, but of course, you know, when you think of the first year of the, the G7 uh, in the pandemic, that was when uh, President Trump was at the helm and he tried to uh, defund the World Health Organization. So things didn't start particularly well then. But it's, I think it was really last year where, where there were really big hopes and expectations that the G7 would get its act together. Uh, there were very clear asks put to the G7 in terms of sharing vaccines, funding Act A uh, properly, um, and ensuring the technology transfers and, uh, that would enable countries to make their, their own uh, vaccines. And this was from the international, um, sorry, the independent uh, um, review panel that had been put together to um, really advise on, on what the world should do to tackle the pandemic. But also you had the major UN agencies all lined up behind this agenda. Unfortunately, though, the, the, the G7 has performed spectacularly badly and basically did nothing on, the, on, on those agendas. There was a sort of there were pledges made to uh, provide 870 million doses of vaccines, but a year on now we can assess how that's gone and, and it hasn't gone at all well. You know the the UK, for example, has only met 39% of its commitment, um, and um, you know there has been this woeful lack of vaccinations uh, provided in developing countries. Act A is about 11 billion uh, dollars short at the moment, and, and when it's come to the technology transfers. It has been G7 countries that have been sort of um, blocking attempts to um, accelerate the transfer of technology through TRIPS waivers, with the UK in particular, um, and Switzerland, admittedly not a G7 country, I, I think the main uh, obstacles. So um, it hasn't been good at all. And, and so therefore, when you look at the G7 communique this year, where um, we understand that, you know, health has barely been discussed at all, but in the very first sentence they the it starts we reaffirm our commitment to enabling global access uh, um, to vaccines therapeutics and diagnostics and medical goods given that track record you, you can automatically say you know that who who gives that any credibility and i think that in uh, the world of uh, global health but increasingly developing countries 
people just therefore just dismiss, you know, sort of what the, the G7 is saying it's going to do. And we are hearing that, that the many developing countries are really, really angry um, that the G7 has neglected um, the, the rest of the world through this pandemic. Um, and, um, you know, th this has, I think, got big implications that, you know, for the, the G7 going forward, because countries are then saying, well, why should we collaborate and cooperate when it comes to other issues around climate change? You, you've let us down in this last crisis. We agree there's another big crisis coming up, but why, why should we take you seriously? But even when it comes to the, um, the war in, in Ukraine and countries sort of saying quite explicitly, um, why should we support your war in Ukraine when you haven't supported us at this time of greatest need? And I think very significant that South Africa and India, who were leading the call for a TRIPS waiver, uh, haven't been supportive. Um, in, in the United Nations to date of, of condemnation of, of Russia. So um, it hasn't been good. And um, it's difficult to see, you know, this next year, how that's going to improve. There may be some expectations, though, that next year, Japan, which is very strong on health and particularly on universal health coverage, I think will step up and, and things might improve. But, but it really has been a pretty dismal three years unfortunately, um, with respect to the G7 and health. Uh, thank you, Rob. Um, <laughs> I, the sun is shining, so it would be good <laughs> to have some good news, but let, let's not worry about that. Tim, I want to come to you on the food security question. You know, we can't wait three years. We can't wait for Japan. This is, this is for many individuals around the world. And remember, there's still Afghanistan and a major food insecurity crisis there. Um, what, what is the solution? And please don't limit yourself to the G7. Does the G7 have a role to play? But what should be the concrete, immediate steps taken to try and, you know, if, if one of the goals is actually to bring a broader um, base of countries on side for uh, support for the war in Ukraine, for example, um, what, what are the short-term measures that, in your view, should be taken to address the problem of food prices, food insecurity. You ran some tremendous conversations on this uh, at our London conference just last week, which I hope all of you will watch um, the recordings of. But Tim, what is, what is your response to that? So there's probably just about enough grain in the world to feed everybody in the way that they used to be uh, fed. The trouble is that uh, there isn't an excess over demand and the grain that's being produced is in different places than uh, traditionally. Um, but it's primarily at this moment one of price and distribution um, in the sense that because the way commodity markets work like energy markets work, everything is very expensive. So for the majority of the world, everyone can access food if they've got money if they haven't got money, there's a problem. Um, so part of the issue, I think, is how do we ensure that grain comes out of Ukraine? And that's a big uh, diplomatic thing about freeing the uh, ports of Odessa because they're being blockade, blockaded as a kind of weapon of war by, by Russia. Part of it, I think, is also about ensuring that uh, there is the transport logistics and the insurance for boats uh, that can take grain from other places where there might be uh, more storage. Part of it is also, for example, uh, changing uh, the, uh, 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 the existing demand for food. So a significant amount of global grain goes into biofuels, which we typically end up in cars in the US and in Europe. If we stopped by using grain for biofuels, that would allow more grain to go on the, on the market, so removing biofuels mandates. Um, China has traditionally um, elevated food security as a very much a national security concern. It has got silos that are stock full of grain, much more grain in silos in China than there is in not coming out of Ukraine. So there could be a diplomatic effort uh, with China to release more grain, but of course that has politics associated with it. Um, and then the other thing, uh, as I've said in various meetings recently, a very small change in 
the way that we use grain in the rich world, where the bulk of grain goes into animal feed, a very small change in the way we consume animals would free up lots more grain that could be, uh, uh, in theory, available on global markets. So, uh, you know, shifting, eating less, 15% less chicken and pork in Europe would free up the same amount of grain that's not come, come out of Ukraine or is not coming out of Ukraine. So there are lots of things that can be done, but all of them require political leadership and all of them require uh, money. Uh, and, you know, as I flagged in my opening remarks, the fact that the World Food Programme is uh, re re asking for 22 billion of money and the rich world can't even find uh, more than 20% uh, of that at the moment means that suffering is going to increase in, in the really challenged parts of the world from a humanitarian perspective. So there are lots of things, you know, we could give money to WFP, you know, uh, but the, the measures that have been put in place so far have largely been marginal um, rather Tim, than me, instrumental. Tim, let me come back to you before I come to, to Rob and Marianne. And then, and then to those of you in the audience, and please do um, have your questions ready. I'm gonna come back to you on the China question. And you, you know, you've, you've, you've given us some possible solutions. You've given us a great context. You've sort of ducked the political question. And I wanna, I wanna push you a, a little bit on it. Um, you know, we've seen NATO, it looks like in the strategic concept, China will be named a systemic challenge. Uh, NATO, China comes up in the G7, maybe Marianne could tell us a little bit more about how, what the framing was of, you know, the so-called China challenge from the G7. Um, you know, from A, from your perspective, and B, in terms of what you're seeing, uh, take what conversations you're seeing take place, perhaps across expert communities in China, in the United Kingdom, across uh, the rest of the G7 as well. Um, is there more going on to try and, you know, unlock access or to get China to participate in the, in this broader question of food insecurity by uh, getting giving access to grain? Are there any, is there any movement in this, in this direction, in your view, you know, what kind of, if you don't mind me asking, what kind of deals do you think should be cut um, to make China part of the solution uh, rather than part of the problem? And are people pressing on that? Is that a real life conversation in certain communities, you know, below the radar of, of what the rest of us are seeing? Um, well, to answer the second question first, no, I don't think it is a real life conversation. But if you think of the challenges that we collectively face, they include climate change, and China is quite an active player in the climate change uh, uh, sphere, uh, and has got more ambitious plans to decarbonize than almost anywhere else in the world. Um, so, so I don't think it's impossible to imagine a, a, a situation where instead of China being ostracized, it wins political brownie points by cooperating with the rest of the world to solve some of the global issues. Now, whether or not that would be acceptable to the West and the degree to which that would be seen to be a positive solution um, as opposed to unacceptable. And I think the starting point is that China is a problem in all spheres, but yet we do have to cooperate with China uh, over climate change and the biodiversity loss and a whole range of other things. So just as in the, the old Cold War, I suppose the new Cold War, uh, you know, we were still cooperating on uh, nuclear disarmament talks, even though everyone was at loggerheads with the, with the East. Um, you know, there, there is, I think, political space for this to be uh, higher up the agenda than it currently is. But uh, yeah, politically, it's hugely difficult to imagine. So Marianne, what is what is your kind of take on how China featured in the G7 conversations as a sort of, is it a background condition? Is there explicit language? What is the sort of um, the backdrop that China- There is quite explicit language and quite a lot of emphasis actually of the 28 pages in a communique about one page is dedicated to China, which I thought was really interesting because I thought it was going to take more of a, of a backdrop, but it did not. And building on what um, Tim has just said, you know, it starts by focusing on the cooperation with China on shared global challenges, whether that's climate change or biodiversity loss, but then quickly gets into the, the nitty gritty details of the differences and the concerns around the challenges that China presents. 
ranging from you know calling on China for the peaceful settlement of disputes to um, very much focusing on concrete issues with Hong Kong, South China Sea, um, you know Uyghurs and domestic labor issues and human rights concerns to then you know draw the conclusion that China is also very much in a position to press Russia to stop its military aggression um, and essentially G7 leaders call on China um, that they need to take a more active role in um, yeah, getting Russia to immediately and unconditionally withdraw troops from Ukraine. So again, I would say that um, it's, it's quite astonishing that um, China plays such a, a prominent role and that you know, looking across the diversity of the G7 countries, um, actually China is called out specifically because in the past and some practices, particularly in the economic space, Germany, for example, has been quite reluctant to single out China in name and was more inclined to call out the practices of let's say non-market economy practices. So I think this is very much an important step. It's also clearly, as you mentioned, linked to the upcoming um, or the NATO summit that is taking place, where, as you say, you know, China is called out as a systemic challenge for the first time. And again, for the first time for the NATO summit, there are um, other leaders of Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand that will be joining. So again, that is against that larger backdrop of, of China. I mean, I guess the other thing to note there, of course, is that China has already responded to um, the US moves in the Indo-Pacific by saying that it looks to them like the United States is trying to form a, a, a version of NATO. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific, the, the sort of moves um, as you've outlined them at the G7 uh, in NATO don't seem like the kind of moves that are gonna do anything to bring uh, China on side, if that's what you know Tim might've suggested. That is important. I'm very curious if anybody has anything to say about India, the other question, the other country that we've been talking about a lot, um, not least because they didn't come on board um, the, the UN resolution condemning uh, Russia's invasion or on board the sanctions, of course, but they're clearly very important to broader strategic alignments. But Rob, let me come to you. And I guess in the health side, ask the same sort of question that I asked um, Tim, which is, there's a lot going on. There are a lot of, you know, um, shortfalls. But if there was one thing that you think that, you know, the G7 could and should really get behind in the short term, only one thing, you know, what would it be? And maybe, you know, is the G7 not really the right place? But, you know, what is the one very concrete, very short term thing that that should be delivered in your view? Well, I think that the um, the one good multilateral mechanism that really did come out of the pandemic, you know, was Act A and, and COVAX. It was a good idea and, and, you know, exactly what was needed. The problem was it was sort of undermined by our countries, you know, in us basically buying up all the vaccines and funding it late. And therefore, there were no vaccines left when COVAX started purchasing. So I, I think to really, you know, demonstrate true commitment to Act A and its replacement, to fund it properly, um, and sort of give it sort of greater powers would, would be something very important because, of course, you know, we can't rule out there being sort of new variants coming along that are going to require, you know, revaccinating pretty quickly. And, and um, you know, it's just going to be essential that we don't fall into this mess again of the vaccine rollout being so inequitable. So I, I think, you know, that has, you know, sort of been, um, you know, the biggest problem, which I think could be addressed relatively easily with sort of decent commitments of, of, of funding. Uh, but I think, you know, there are major concerns that, you know, that if the G7 didn't come up with that type of money during the pandemic, you know, the fact that, you know, there is a perception that, that you know, the pandemic is waning, particularly in G7 countries, what is the likelihood of that happening in the near future? And I, I think a lot of people in the global health world I think are sort of recognizing really that multilateral health financing is and the and the massive threat one thinks of other mechanisms like the global fund um, trying to organize a big replenishment at the moment. So I, I think you know that the likelihood of the G7 doing that is 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 fairly remote, unfortunately. Um, but that's what they should do. Good. Um, very helpful. We have a tremendous audience. I can see your names. I see really great people like Lori. Theo, Cynthia, Mary, Trish, Ewan, and others. So I'd love to get your questions. Um, 
and um, and and others as well. So please, um, if you put if you raise your hand, let me let me come. Actually, we've got a few questions in the in the chat here. Let me come to Gioria Sherry, um, and I'll read this one on your behalf. But if others are prepared to ask their question, I'd really love to get your voices as well as your questions. So let me start with this. It's a really interesting discussion from the panelists' comments so far. It seems that the G7 is underwhelmed in many respects. What commitments can we expect to realistically make any impact? So I'm going to hold that and actually, and also come to, I assume Sam has a question to ask. Okay, good. Questions from others. Oh, sorry, not you, sorry. Okay. Um, Trish, Mary, Theo, and Cynthia, a question from one of you will be tremendous given I know you have plenty to contribute to the conversation. And while we're waiting for, for one of my colleagues, Georgia, um, if anybody wants to come and try and answer Georgia's question, that would be, that would be great. Uh, what commitments can we expect to realistically make any impact? Of those that have already been put out there, which of these do you have the most hope um, that will actually be realized and have some impact. Tim, do you want to try that question? Yeah, I mean, I think there is there is impact in the sense that the narrative alone uh, creates some space for other countries uh, to engage in the agenda. So that's kind of intangible, but in in a sense, but um, uh, nonetheless, it's important. You know. The, the, I think the model for the G7 really is to create momentum for uh, the G8, uh, the G19, or the G20, uh, or the G77 to kind of drive things ahead. So we shouldn't understate the 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 potential for uh, just reaffirming commitments to things like climate change. Uh, uh, at a time where energy transitions are really high up the agenda and uh, energy security matters. Um, and then almost all of the things that it promises to do will have some degree of impact. It's just the scale of the, the impact is not matching the scale of the challenge in any of the dimensions as far as I can see. And you know, I come back to this issue again if the World Food Programme needs 20 odd billion for uh, humanitarian efforts and the richest economies can't give more than 20% of that, then there is something deeply wrong in their model of leadership if we want to have global cooperative multilateral governance that works because it's just, we're not doing our fair share given what we could do ever. Thank you. Uh, Marianne, you have a two finger and then we'll come to Trish and then to Ewan. Just to answer that question, perhaps not necessarily saying it's a realistic option, but um, potentially something that could move the needle is that discussion of the price caps on either oil or gas. The US is pushing a cap on oil prices and the Italians are more you know, planning a, a cap on gas prices. This is all motivated by concerns that Russia is actually benefiting from high energy prices, despite the restrictions that G7 members have imposed on Russian energy imports. And so the idea that's currently being discussed and the language in the communique is, is quite ambiguous. It's around exploring the feasibility that is, again, um, you know, more around temporary measures. Uh, the idea is that you prohibit services that actually facilitate the transportation of Russian seaborne oil unless the price is at or below a cap. And you would enforce that by limiting insurance, for example, by limiting financing for importers unless they adhere to the price ceiling. And I think that could be a small step, a very concrete but specific step to address the dual concerns around making sure the sanctions work, but not necessarily um, at the expense of hurting our own economies. At the same time, that is very, very ambitious and it's very, very complex because you know it would have to be um, very much supported by industry and by a range of non-G7 countries. So I'm not saying that this is going to realistically happen, but there is a real push and momentum to actually implement this and then enforce it. 
Rob, you have a two finger, I think. Yeah, just a very quick one, which is a commitment that's in the communique that really could make a huge difference um, were it sort of done quickly and much quicker than is anticipated. And that's to fund the World Health, World Health Organization properly. I mean, you know, my goodness, do we need the World Health Organization? And, and um, you know, the fact that, you know, its budget is, is barely that of a, a large <laughs> US hospital. Uh, is, is patently ridiculous. And, and the commitment at the moment is that assessed contributions will increase so that, that you know, 50% of the WHO's budget will come from a sort of formula of assessed contributions. But that's by 2028, 29. I mean, come on, you know, that, I mean, surely that can be done next year. So, so that would be one that I think would make a big difference. Uh, thank you, Rob. We're gonna come to Trish. Um, I really, really don't know enough about the role of all those countries that are uh, united through the CPTPP. And I'm just wondering, because, uh, as you said, Japan's going to host it uh, next year. It's that part of the world where uh, there is a real comprehensive trade agreement between these countries that are not just G7, they're very much outside G7. Does anyone know what is going on in terms of, you know, uh, is it looking different in terms of, uh, you know, if you compare it to the G7 sort of lackluster approach that we've seen on, as you say, global health and, and uh, food security and uh, fuel, etc. It Do you know enough of what, what that CPTPP uh, has, what role it plays in terms of galvanizing funding, galvanizing, uh, you know, approaches to these massive challenges? Uh, I don't know enough. I'm just asking. Thanks. I'm happy to take that on. I think Leslie is um, experiencing some difficulties. So let me just take that question on straight away. And I think um, in terms of the CPTPP, there really is no role in terms of you know galvanizing support or funding. China has, in fact, um, expressed interest in joining the CPTPP as well. But I think you're absolutely right to point at the role that Japan plays not only in the CPTPP, but in other initiatives in the trade space, and not just in the sense of traditional free trade agreements that are really about lowering tariffs. Um, the future really is around supply chain resilience and regulatory cooperation, particularly in the digital space. And in those two areas, I think Japan could make a real difference. Japan is also part of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, a new initiative that the US just launched um, a couple of weeks ago. And, and there again, that emphasis on supply chain resilience is, is something that you know, is not just in the, in the context of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and supply chain fragmentation, but very much comes also out of the pandemic and long-term structural challenges such as strategic competition with China. And I think here, if there is cooperation, for example, on an early warning mechanism, that could have a real potential, not just with relation to food security, for example, but also with regards to um, semiconductors, for example. So I, I do think that there is um, a lot more scope on bringing these different initiatives together. And um, with the US, a key player in the IPAF, uh, this Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, in other mechanisms such as the um, US EU Trade and Technology Council, like the, G the G7 is the obvious place to actually bring those initiatives together. Unfortunately, this is not what we have seen at the Leader Summit just now, but there is, um, again, a potential for, for Japan to hopefully connect the dots next year. Uh, does anybody else want wish to add to that? And we've got we do okay good. Let me come to um, Sam. I'll read your question and and Duff. We'll take those two together, uh, and then we'll come to Mary. Unless somebody else has a question they'd like to speak. Uh, Sam, after Sri Lanka asks after Sri Lanka and with Pakistan, Nepal, and others on the brink, is a sovereign debt crisis imminent? And will this signal any end to the Chinese backed financing, particularly from Belt and Road? And Duff says, while the, while the G7 uh, demonstrated an inclination for big words over bold action, are there any takeaways from the latest meeting that would convince the rest of the world that the G7 is relevant and consequential? Um, I, I guess I would add to that, it's not only convincing the rest of the world, I think one of the G, leading G7 members, um, the United States, it might be important to convince um, Americans that the, that the G7 is, I mean, I, you know, 
um, sad but true that the G7 is relevant and consequential. Uh, any any answers to that, Rob? I'll turn over to you first. Uh, yes, well, it, the uh, on the issue is the G7 still sort of consequential and, and useful. Um, I'd actually started the, the session. It was meant to be just uh, for the uh, our group, but put in a little piece that Jeff Sachs, the development economist, put last year, basically saying we don't need the G7 anymore. So there's a bit of a sort of polemic. We're basically saying that you know the G7 is is useless. And um, I must say that, that certainly from the, the health perspective, you know, that which, which I'm sort of looking at, it, one struggles to disagree with that, you know, that, that uh, and again, you know, there's been very little sign this year of, of, of any change on, on that score. Um, so, um, yes, I, th I, I think, unfortunately, you know, the, the, the terrible track record continues, but, but that isn't inevitable. And, and I think to some extent, we have to recognise that, the G7 is made up of leaders and, and, you know, that maybe it's this cohort of leaders that's the problem and, and that, you know, where there have been previous um, crises, when one looks back on, say, the, the financial crash of 2008-9, where I think a number of G7 leaders really did step up and really, you know, were extremely consequential, um, you know, it shows it can be done. And, and so, um, you know, maybe, you know, it, it's just that, you know, the luck of the draw, really, that unfortunate these crises that are besetting the world at the moment, we do seem to have uh, major leaders in the G7 who just aren't really demonstrating political leadership. Um, Marianne, two finger. Um, I think we've already kind of started to get into this question of, how useful the organization, or not the organization, the, the platform is for um, the G7, kind of given its share of GDP being around a third, 10% of the population. But I think there is an understanding that the G7 can solve the problems on its own. And hence, you know, they have over the past couple of years invited others as guests, Argentina, India, Indonesia, Senegal, and South Africa took part this year in several of the working sessions during the summit. And I think there is, again, this inclination to say the actual work happens at the G20 or well, now more or less G19. But I, th I think it's also quite interesting to see, or at least in my view, that there is a bit of a transatlantic tension going on right now. The US, I think, is very much doubling down on the G7 with Biden having said it's not a premier vehicle for multilateral engagement. And EU leaders, seem to me at least um, not really wanting to rule out um, that they sit at a G20 table with Russian President Vladimir Putin present when they meet in, um, in Indonesia in November. So there is, I think, a dilemma going on between cementing bonds you know, with the um, emerging economies and the broader G20 group, but at the same time, um, wanting to, to isolate Russia internationally. Um, in terms of you know, the, the G7 also as a leading form of democracy, I think it's quite important to, to highlight that uh, Germany really has taken this quite seriously. They've engaged and exchanged with civil society throughout um, the presidency, which you know, goes until the end of the year. But as, as part of this engagement process, there's been various engagements with business communities, civil society, labor, think tanks, women and youth. And I think that is still um, quite significant to you know, not just look at kind of the democratic principles internationally, but also you know democratic engagement domestically. Um, thank you, Marianne. Uh, it was extremely interesting. Mary Dijewski, um has asked a similar question, but I'm going to read it uh, again because I think you know it, it is clearly something that's on people's mind because many of you are asking the question. <clears throat> and Mary has framed it in a, in a classically hard hitting uh, way. Maybe um, the, the, the G7 was sandwiched between two different summits. It was, it looked very male, very privileged, very secluded in a German castle. It looked like a swan song for the bygone age. Um, once seven richest countries seem to have claimed a global leadership just because of their wealth, that seems over. And I might add, you know, what we all know that it comes in the U.S. context right on the heels of the reversal of um, Roe versus Wade, which I can tell you in my lifetime, I never as a young person would have imagined we, this, this was this was drilled in stone. That was what we were uh, taught to believe. So Biden 
traveled to the G7, not only as an older uh, white man, but as a white man leading a country where people were massed on the streets, mobilized, protesting, galvanized, um, where the political upheaval is nothing short of intense, and where many of you may have watched one of the most dramatic uh, hearings of the January 6th uh, committee took place uh, yesterday. So um, the disconnect between uh, the international side of, um, of US foreign relations and what's happening at home couldn't be more intense. But Tim, maybe you have something to say to Mary's um, rather significant question. Yeah, well, I mean, I must admit, I have some sympathy with it uh, uh, in terms of uh, my opening comments about the sartorial lessons to be learned from the, the boys club. Um, we had a workshop yesterday on kind of changing geopolitics post Ukraine invasion, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Uh, and part of that was a discussion about the, uh, the failure of multilateral institutions and I think one of the things that we concluded was that it's not the institutions that are necessarily failing, it's the politics that governs those institutions and the domestic politics that selects the leaders and prescribes the leaders from being leaders on an international sphere, you know, largely uh, uh, the, the polarization of politics and the populism that's kind of inherent. So the G7 could be a much stronger and has been in the past as a G8 uh, uh, multilateral institution. It's just governments are much more constrained perhaps than they have been in the past in being able to do something for the global good at a time where everybody's looking inwards and saying, let's be transactional, let's only do things that are for our profit rather than for the global common good. So I think there is an element that yes, this is the old world, world order. Yes, it's too white, it's too man, uh, male, it's too elite, but it's also a failure of our domestic politics to give leaders the, the latitude to make better decisions rather than insist that they'll be unelectable if they have an ODA budget that's greater than 0.5% or whatever the domestic politics might be in other places. Over. Rob, do you have anything um, to add to that, perhaps? Yes, I mean, I, I think sort of one uh, point I was, I was hoping to make, you know, sort of with, about this sort of disconnect between what's happening domestically and multilaterally. And, and you know, this is perhaps a positive point, really, to, to, to look forward. And we were being a bit sort of negative today, but I think sort of uh, quite realistic is that I think, you know, so well, there has been this realisation among so many countries that, that sort of multilateral solidarity on a number of fronts, be it, be it at, uh, uh, health reforms or, or food security, um, you know, is, is very disappointing, that, that this might actually create the opportunity for sort of countries to do more radical things domestically, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, the, the pennies dropping that, you know, that in times of great crisis, the West, um, well, the G7 isn't going to sort of ride to the rescue. And um, in particular, you know, we're looking at the potential for, for this, these crises to catalyze a new generation of universal health reforms. That, that if you look through history, it actually has been at times of great crises, be those, uh, you know, economic collapse and, and, you know, that Theo, I think, was asking about sort of debt crises. Um, but also conflict and, and um, you know, even um, public health emergencies have actually um, created the types of conditions that progressive political leaders have wanted to do really dramatic things. And, and so, for example, have introduced big, bold universal health reforms. I mean, that, that's the story of the, the UK and Japan, of course, after the Second World War. So this is something that we're, we're tracking. And I, and I think that uh, you have leaders like... Uh, President Kagame in Rwanda actually saying this now very publicly when he was uh, president of the African Union last year, you know, that basically you can't depend on the West. We are going to have to do this ourselves now. So, so maybe that in, in a number of sectors, you know, the focus is going to switch much more towards domestic reforms, domestic financing, right. and this could be potentially, um, you know, beneficial in the long run. Thank you. I'm going to just quickly mention two other questions and then give each of you a closing comment and you can choose uh, whether to refer, but we're right at the end. Um, and um, we need a little of optimism in here, but I'm not going to ask you to 
not be true to your own intelligence and instincts. Uh, UN Grant says, can the G7 work collectively with UN bodies to, uh, to cut bureaucracy and maximize uh, delivery of grain, vaccines, and other things? Maybe you could say a word on the extent to which that coordination is, is working, Tim. And um, Theo uh, writes, um, if long-term in infrastructure is key, but it's Theo Beale, our uh, Academy fellow, um, if that's not working, what are the short and me medium term tools that can be leveraged to address the needs of developing countries? So with those two questions in mind, in light of um, the conclusion of the G7, the ongoing need for a global recovery that is at least uh, encouraged, if not led by some of these countries, the NATO summit and the way forward. Um, a final remark, let me start um, with, uh, with you, Marianne, and then come to Rob and then to Tim. Right, I think it's um, excellent questions. And I think that you know, issue of um, the partnership for the global infrastructure and investment development is, is going to be one that stays with us, not just um, you know, as part of the summit conclusions, but looking beyond. And I think the, the key issue really is, as you've mentioned, how to engage the private sector, but I think it's also very much how to leverage partnerships with multilateral development banks, with development finance institutions to not only better align efforts, but to also consolidate a pipeline of projects. And I think here, what we really have to see by the end of the year, concrete proposals for developing an investment platform. And I think the focus should rightly be on sustainable infrastructure. Let me also say that um, on the climate club issue, this is something that the G7 under Germany's presidency really needs to drive forward because it is one of those you know, long-term issues. And you know, the G7 presidency of Germany continues until the end of the year. So it's not just over with this summit, but a lot of work remains to be seen in that space, particularly because we have G7 countries such as the US that doesn't have a domestic price on carbon. The EU meanwhile has moved forward with its own a proposal for a carbon water adjustment mechanism. And I do actually think that that is more of a hurdle for this G7 proposal of a climate club. Thank you, uh, Rob. Yeah, it's just going to say that, that uh, you know, of course, it's undoubtedly the case that there are these huge investment needs and, and uh, infrastructure is going to be extremely important. But of course, the, one of the big problems is, it's, you know, these investments take a long time to uh, to, to start and bring benefits. And, and, you know, the world is in great crisis at the moment. So, so I think, you know, that it's going to be very important for progressive political leaders who, who want to keep their countries together and, and really want to stay in power to be able to do those big investments to do to deliver some quick political wins to their, their populations. And, you know, th this is where I think smart politicians are going to be looking for things like rapid universal health reforms and, and education reforms and access to social services. And there is a great track record of this happening, you know, that, that if you look, say, in Latin America now, you know, there's definitely a sort of a, um, a move to the left there, you know, with new democratic governments coming in and, and um, really looking to, to meet the basic needs of their population. So I think smart politicians are going to be looking for the, the quick wins in the social sectors and access to food and things like that, whilst also uh, getting the resources for the long-term infrastructure. Thank you. Tim? Um, well, I, I was thinking of what I could uh, end with that uh, was slightly upbeat, but I can't think of anything. <laughs> so, so my apologies, everybody. I mean, we are clearly in a world where the crises are coming at us thick and fast. There is a widespread acknowledgement, including in the um, uh, communique, that we face many challenges ahead. Uh, and part of that challenge is a challenge of leadership. And part of that challenge is a challenge of multilateral cooperation in a world that's competitive and uh, uh, you, you know, transactional and so on. And um, all I can really say is I hope we kind of come to our senses and we get our political systems right, get our politics right, allow leaders, particularly younger female leaders, to take up the reins of power and fix this world before it's too late for all of the youth in the world today. Sorry, over. That was good. <laughs> it was inspirational. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess that the, the, perhaps one of the notes to conclude on is that even though at the sort of level of high politics, geopolitics, uh, things are challenging uh, to say the best, at the level of um, 
expert communities working transnationally at the level of think tanks, research universities, not only across um, the G7 countries, but across um, many countries far beyond uh, the G7, and that includes China, the level of knowledge, expertise, ambition and drive, and actually private capital going into to finance research is, is important, significant, um, and certainly gives me room um, for optimism. And in the country that I, from which I carry a passport, the attention to science at the highest levels of government is nothing short of phenomenally higher uh, than it was two years ago this time. So I think that that is a real bonus and let's keep it that way because it could get very dark if we don't. Um, thank you for joining us. We were on the record. Please uh, return and um, if you don't have a great summer, but it's a long, long time away from that. <laughs>